In this video, I'm going to show you a curious mixed media drawing technique that combines wax-based color pencils such as these made by Prismacolor with acrylic gesso. Strange I know, but it works surprisingly well and will be useful to those who enjoy using color pencils but are frustrated by their limitations or are just looking for a new way of using them. This method was taught to me some 30 years ago by an old illustrator and was apparently a widely used method in the illustration field in the 20th century. Since I teach illustration, I thought my students would find this technique interesting, but when I went online to look for more information, I couldn't find anything on it at all. So I decided to make a tutorial, lest this way of working is lost to history. Before I begin, I need to point out what some of you might be thinking, that this technique is not archival, since acrylic gesso will have problems adhering to wax-based pencils. Making work in ways that stand the test of time is not something illustrators in the 20th century concern themselves with, since their work was intended to last only long enough to be scanned or photographed, after which it would be discarded. When I started teaching illustration in the early 2000s, I discovered that the illustration instructor who I took over for taught his students to paint in oil directly over unprimed toned paper. Having come from a fine art program where the use of archival materials was emphasized to an obsessive degree, I was at first horrified. Now my opinion has relaxed. Yes, working in an archival way is important if the work is intended for sale. But art is increasingly being viewed on the computer. And if that's your intention, and you don't plan on selling or exhibiting your work physically, I see no problem in using methods that are not structurally sound. Color pencil drawing is usually a transparent technique like watercolor that is done on white paper. This means that it requires you to systematically work from light to dark, carefully retaining the white of the paper for brighter areas and highlights, like you would in a watercolor painting. And while you can lighten areas and put in highlights later with a white pencil, it's not particularly effective because the white pencil lacks opacity. The transparency of color pencils gives them a vibrancy that is hard to achieve with opaque methods, and the vivid colors, combined with multiple layers of hatching, allows artists to create bright, energetic works of art. The medium has a number of limitations, however, that can make it very frustrating to use. The main one is its incorrectability. Color pencils don't erase well, and once you have something down, it's almost impossible to cover it up or correct it. Here's how it works. Instead of working on white paper, we're going to start on toned gray paper. This is a paper made by Canson, their steel gray color. This paper is very good for this technique because it has just enough tooth to hold many layers of colored pencil, but is not so rough that the texture is distracting. It's also sturdy enough to take aqueous media, or acrylic gesso, without too much buckling. Unlike standard colored pencil technique, which relies on transparency, this technique is more opaque, similar to chalk-based colored pencil where the original paper color will not be seen in the final drawing. This is why, once I've indicated the shape of the sphere and applied a layer of shadow, I fill in the entire area of the sphere, both the shadows and the lights, with my white pencil. The white pencil will serve two purposes in my drawing. It'll be used to lighten values, and it'll also be used to soften and blend. This means that, unlike standard color pencil technique, where the white pencil is used quite infrequently, here it'll be used a lot. I recommend buying a few white pencils since you'll go through them very quickly. At this stage I work using just two colors, brown and white, to establish the form. One advantage of this technique is that it separates the problem of value and color. By focusing on just getting the values right, I'm not distracted by having to think about the colors, allowing me to complete that task more effectively, since all I need to think about here is making the form turn. Notice that as I add white into the shadows, they soften and become more opaque. The gray of the paper will show through a little at this point, since colored pencil is semi-transparent, but I'm not going to force it, allowing the opacity to build up little by little with each layer. In general, it's important to build up gradually without applying too much pressure, because that will flatten the paper fibers, making the surface very slick, preventing the colored pencils from building up properly. Now that the form looks nice and round, I start to build up the color. I usually start in the shadow and then switch to the lights. Again, because colored pencils are transparent, I think of the stage as akin to the glazing techniques used in oil painting. Since the monochrome underdrawing is providing the form, I don't have to think about it quite as much in the color stage. At this point, I alternate between adding layers of white and adding additional color saturation until I have the value and color and opacity I'm looking for. Here's the completed drawing. Working on toned paper has some advantages. Because I'm starting with gray, I'm able to build the lights and darks at the same time, making it easier to create a full range of values and to create the illusion of form. 
Color is also easier to see correctly on gray paper. Here's the drawing so far using only the color pencil. This drawing is fairly strong and is close to complete, but since color pencil is semi-transparent, the gray shows through the layers, so the drawing has less saturation and contrast than if I was starting with white. This is where acrylic gesso comes in very handy. By taking a little bit of white acrylic gesso and thinning it slightly with water, you can brighten up the lighter areas and make the highlights glow. And the brilliance of this technique is that gesso dries to a toothy, paper-like surface. That means that you can go over the gesso with color pencils. Here I'm going over the brighter areas with more color and adding a touch of color to the highlights. This technique also allows me the flexibility to add light details late into the drawing process. Here I'm adding a bluish backlight to add a touch of drama to the drawing. In regular color pencil technique, this would not be possible at this late stage. With this method, such touches can be added at any point in time. Here's the drawing in the first stage where I only used color pencil. It's pretty strong and could be considered complete, but compare that with the drawing after the application of gesso and even more color pencil. To my mind, the addition of gesso allows me to add additional contrast and saturation, negating the disadvantages of working on toned paper. It also allows me to make corrections and introduce effects that would be difficult to achieve in pure color pencil technique. Let me show you how this method works with a more complex subject by doing a little portrait of my daughter. Once again, I start this drawing in a neutral color, in this case, brown. You should avoid starting your drawings with bright colors since you risk having them strike through the semi-transparent layers you place on top. I spent a good deal of time working on the monochrome stage, taking the drawing almost to a full range of value. The more time you spend here, the easier time you'll have completing the color stage. All the problems with drawing need to be fixed, since you'll have a hard time making drawing corrections once you start with the color. As I previously mentioned during the sphere demo, one of the main strengths of this technique is that it separates the problem of value and color, allowing you to work on the two tasks separately. The old masters understood the advantages of this and often completed a monochrome underpainting called a grisaille before adding color to their paintings. This is particularly useful when dealing with a difficult drawing problem such as a portrait. Now that I've completed the monochrome stage, I'm going to start going in on the color. This video is meant to be an introduction to this unusual technique rather than a demonstration of how to draw a portrait, so I'm not going into detail here. Perhaps if there's interest, I can make a video where I show the entire process. But to summarize, at this stage, I'm putting down a base layer of burnt sienna all over the lighter areas, and then making adjustments to this color, a little more yellow here, a little more red there, and also adding cooler tones with light blue. It's those subtle shifts in color that make skin tones come alive. The semi-transparent nature of color pencils, and the fact that they're applied in multiple layers, make them a great medium for creating effective skin tones. Now that I've taken the drawing to near completion with the color pencils, it's time to pull out the gesso and add some pop. Gesso is fantastic for areas of sharp detail, such as the little reflections on the eyelids. It's also great for getting those bright highlights in the eye to really pop out. I'm also going to add a little bit of it to the highlights on the nose and forehead. Once the gesso has dried, I can add additional color to the gessoed areas so that my highlights don't look bleached out. The great thing about this technique is that the gesso blends so organically with the color pencils, so much so that you can't really tell it's there. Here's the completed drawing. The addition of gesso adds detail, contrast, and texture that I couldn't achieve with a color pencil alone. Here's one more way you can use this technique. Here I'm doing a little drawing of a tree from memory. Once again, I start with my color pencils and do the drawing as if I'm not anticipating the gesso layer. Once I bring a degree of finish to the tree, I take out my gesso and use it to add bright highlights to some of the leaves, to lighten the trunk in places, and to even place a light sky in the background. Once the gesso layer is dry, I go over it and add some brilliant color, giving the tree texture, contrast, and dimensionality that, again, would have been hard to achieve with the pencils alone. Here is the finished drawing. I, for one, think it has a pretty neat look to it, with the energetic stroke making and layering of drawing, and the strong contrast and sense of depth of painting. I hope you found this demonstration useful and that you're inspired to give this method a try and see what you can do with it. As I see it, an artist must push themselves in two different directions. The first direction is to master the media they're working in. 
The second direction is to experiment with other media and seek out new, innovative ways of making art. This experimentation can result in all kinds of unexpected, interesting results, but more importantly, it spurs on artistic growth. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, leave them below, and I'll be happy to respond.